Good evening. I hate to break up some parties here, but <laughs> but good evening, everyone, and, and uh, welcome to 19 Washington Square North, the intellectual center and home of NYU Abu Dhabi here in New York. My name is Michael Pruganen. I'm a professor of biology here at NYU New York, and I also run a laboratory at NYU Abu Dhabi, and I serve as the academic director here at 19 Washington Square North. So welcome, everyone. So it's a pleasure to have you here uh, for another academic year of exciting and stimulating programs at 19 Washington Square North. Over the academic year, 19 hosts is host to numerous activities from lectures, conferences, exhibitions in their openings, and as a meeting place for students and faculty, and indeed members of the public to interact and to learn. A key partner of, our, a partner of ours is the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute in Abu Dhabi in New York, which organizes many of the activities here that offers the Washington Square community opportunities to hear experts talk about their research and its societal relevance, techno technological and cultural impact, and importance to the world at large. I want to acknowledge the work here of Sharon Hakakin Bergman, the Director of Academic and Research Programs of NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, who with her staff puts together many of the activities here. For tonight also, very specially, we would like to thank Professor Catherine Corey of the Tisch School of the Arts and also of NYU Abu Dhabi, who has helped organize and is actually responsible for many of the arts programming we're doing this year. So thank you very much, Catherine. She's a great friend and member of our community as well. So today we're very, very pleased to see all of you in a special panel that celebrates the arts program at NYU Abu Dhabi and a discussion by the recent alumni of, the program, of their program and their journeys through it and after. This is a great opportunity for both to learn from them and to understand their journeys as they've gone through these programs. So we have four very special panelists. First of all, and when I call you, you may want to come up, we have Fatima Ma'an, who's a playwright from Lahore, Pakistan, currently based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, Fatima is a graduate of NYU Abu Dhabi, class of 2018. She recently graduated from Boston University's playwright MFA. Fatima has invested in harnessing the power of theater to ask deeper questions and writes plays that center the Pakistani lived experience and unpack social political issues from that region. I'd also like to say that in three weeks, we are having a stage reading of one of her plays here at 90 Washington Square North. Um, and so I hope you'll join us for that and you'll be getting that soon. Next, we have Adam Ashrif El Sayy, who is a writer of stage and screenplays about modern humans living across and between cultures. Like Fatima, she is NYU Abu Dhabi 2018. Adam's plays include, including Ala Family Trilogy, Drowning in Cairo, Revelation, Memorial, and Jamestown Williamsburg have been developed and seen at New York Theater Workshop, The Lark, NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, The Alliance Theater, and Golden Thread Productions. Adam is an alumni of the Laboratory for Global Performance at Georgetown University and an MFA in playwriting from Brooklyn College. Welcome, Adam. Next, we have Ariana Gail Stuckey. I hope I'm not right. Stuckey <laughs> is an actor and playwright, also NYU Abu Dhabi 2018. I'm beginning to see a theme here. And an MFA from Juilliard. She's most interested in theater's power to help us encounter differences without fear. She recently played Mayelia Ewo in the first national tour of Aaron Sorkin's To Kill a Mockingbird for over 500 performances. Her play Memorial, co written uh, with Adam. Uh, was seen at NYU TW's Adelphi Residency and Alliance Theater's Candeda Festival um, with productions at NYU Tisha's main stage in at Juilliard. Finally, we have Atilio Rigotti, who's a Chilean theater maker, game designer, and teacher, who is NYU Abu Dhabi 2014. He co-founded Glitch, a program combining digital and physical mediums with new forms of storytelling, and has been featured in collaborations with Kaki King, um, with Kaki King at the Kennedy Center and the Juilliard School. Their video design work has been part of several Broadway and off-Broadway productions, and his work as a director <clears throat> is recognized by the New York Times, Vulture, and American Theater Magazine. He was also an associate artist with Theater Me Too and an NYTW Artistic Fellow. And finally, especially, to moderate the panel, we have our very own Ruben Polento, the Associate Dean for the Institute of Performing Arts at Tisch, and the founding artistic director, director of Theater Me Too. With over 45 company created works, Me Too has been presented nationally and internationally. Ruben served as founding theater program director and associate dean for the Arts Center at NYU Abu Dhabi and recently served as chair of this drama. Thank you very much for moderating this. Evening. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 
we'll get ourselves settled. Nobody fall off the stage. <laughs> um, and uh, I believe we have to use the mics for recording or is that true? Yes, I'm getting thumbs up. So even though it's a, a small room and we tend to be loud, I know this group. Uh, uh, I want to make sure that uh, we are recorded. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here. My name is Ruben Polendo. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here uh, and so excited to be in a room with these incredible artists uh, uh, and dear colleagues and so grateful that you made time to be here and seeing so many familiar faces. Um, so what we'll do this evening is uh, we'll spend a little time in conversation uh, with our panel um, and then we'll turn some time over to some questions that might come up that I hope are seated from the conversation that we'll have. Um, but I want to begin before I give a little bit of, of further context, I want to begin um, with just a, a, another round of introductions, just to hear from the artists. Uh, and I wanna, I, I'm gonna ask each of you if you would just uh, reintroduce your name, uh, your pronouns, and if you could share your artistic practice. Um, and I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Atilio, can I pick on you to start? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Atilio Rigotti. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and my practice, I always like to say I am five things, uh, and I take very seriously all five of them. I'm a performer, I'm a theater artist, I'm a technology artist, uh, I'm a game designer, and I'm a teacher. Thank you. Fatima? Hi, everyone. I'm Fatima. I use she, her pronouns, and um, I'm a playwright, a dramaturg. Uh, I do whatever <laughs> needs to be done. Uh, as a producer, I guess, most recently, um, yeah, just shuffling between hats um, as they come. Thank you. Adam? Um, hello, everyone. My name is Adam El Sayeg. I use he, him pronouns. And yeah, I would say that I my larger umbrella thing is a, being a storyteller. And within that, I consider in that order playwriting, dramaturgy, screenwriting, and being an educator and then a producer. But playwright primarily is the big one, I think. Hi, my name is Ariana Gelsuki. I am an actor and a playwright. And I help my friends whenever they have fun artistic things to do. That is the best description at the end of that. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, and uh, as we begin, I just want to give a, a little bit of, of quick context about the thing that brings us all together, which is NYU Abu Dhabi. I had the great privilege uh, to be invited at the end of 2008 and the beginning of 2009 to be part of this conversation at NYU about the global network. And there was this great experiment at hand, which was the beginning of a global campus in Abu Dhabi. Uh, an incredible leader whose uh, fingerprint is beautifully all over this project is Hilary Ballin, who is a remarkable scholar, collaborator, and just leader, who brought me and several of us into the conversation. And I remember sitting in this room, and it was really a seed, even though so much work had gone into it. And one of the questions was, should NYU Abu Dhabi, that was to reflect NYU, should it have an arts program and should it have a theater program? And they sort of asked the wrong person because short of jumping on the table, I was like, of course it should, what do you mean, right? It can't. Uh, and to me, the question was not should it, but how? How do we create a global space? How do we actually engage with what is there truly and make that part of the process and really create forward thinking artists and generative collaborators? And so that really began the question uh, uh, for me and it became addictive. Um, I uh, signed on to be the head of the theater program and serve as associate dean uh, to an incredible, incredible group of collaborators, including many who are here. Uh, I was just sharing uh, that one of my favorite people I just have to name is the incredible scholar and mentor of mine who was Dean Judy Miller at the time, uh, who was really part of that um, part of that vision, right, of really building from the ground up. But the big question is, who would come to that university? And who would come to study art, right? That was truly the question. And as bombastic as I was about like, yes, I must have it. When that question came up, I was like, oh, okay. Let's see how the, right? And then they came, they came, they showed up, they came. And the only word that I can use to describe, and th there's some other folks who came, right, were alums. The only word that I could think of, it was these ferocious, curious, incredibly smart weirdos of the greatest proportions. And I say weirdo in the best sense. It was individuals who had a unique way of looking at the world, even whilst they weren't aware of how unique the way they were looking at the world was. And it was really, really remarkable to come into that space and to engage with those students. 
what was most exciting to me and the last two bits of context that I'll give is that for me, it was really meaningful to be in that space because I myself in the US was an international student. I was raised in Mexico. I came from Mexico to the US to study in college. And there's a very particular space you inhabit when you engage in that kind of global uh, conversation. And what I realized was really a space that I shared with all of the students there was forget the brilliance and the fierceness and the intelligence and the weirdness, but it was that they were borderlanders, that there were individuals that were not only part of their identity was to be borderlanders, but that's where they thrived. They thrived in spaces where they were told, you cannot build here. And they would go, yeah, you can. I can put one foot here and I can do this. I can be in science and I can be in art. I can make a project and also think about the finances. I can like truly like have this multiplicity and to do it quite naturally. And I just came alive and it really began to give orientation to what was to be that space. For me, what was most exciting, and I say this to all my students, is that when I meet students and here as a professor, I say this to them, you've heard this a million times, which is that the least interesting thing about my students is that they're students. That's the most boring thing about them. The coolest thing is that they're our future colleagues. And as professors, as teachers, we get the great privilege of meeting our future colleagues early in their career. I say that to students, and I'll say, because your work will impact me, my work will impact you, hopefully, maybe we'll work together. And they think I'm being poetic. I'm not. My students, who are my future colleagues, are my colleagues and continue to be meaningful colleagues in the field. So to me, it's a very personal and really moving privilege to be here with you all um, and to and to share this space, not as students, but as colleagues. Um, and I, I hope that you know that's not a compliment, it's just a fact, like that's, we're in the field together. Um, and as I always say, the reason we work so hard with our students is, is really selfish. I want great colleagues in the field. And I look at my dear friend, Catherine Corre, and we want good colleagues in the field. <laughs> and this is part of the impulse into that student space. And so I'm thrilled to be with you all as colleagues. Um, so I'll begin my question. If I start crying at any moment, just ignore me and keep talking. Um, I, I want to play a little bit with timeline. So we're going to go back a little bit in time and build uh, onto some journeys in Abu Dhabi. But I'm going to send you back to uh, earlier times before Abu Dhabi. Um, could you share with us very briefly your first memory of making art? Your first sort of art, even it's with a question of, I think it was art. Um, yeah, anybody want to jump in? I love that you're all pretending that you're shy. <laughs> Sometimes we are. <laughs> um, I remember being five years old. I'd learned how to write at this point. I could write letters. And I was in ballet class, and I hated ballet class. I still hate ballet class. If I ever have to take one, I'm not a dancer. I've never been. But they'd give us a CD of all of the classical music that all of the girls would dance to for ballet. And I would write love songs to the classical music. I'd write the lyrics and then I would make up dances or whatever. But the first memory I have is writing these awful, awful, awful love songs as a five-year-old in my room. And they were love songs? They were love songs. Oh, they were absolutely, there was a boy named Colton Smith <laughs> who was my first grade crush. And he would, uh, we would tell crazy, crazy stories about like, fighting monsters. We try to one-up each other about what stories had happened at home the day before. And I fell in love with him and I would write these love songs that he never, ever saw. <laughs> That's the first at one. At age five. At age five. Yeah. You asked. <laughs> All right. And we brought him as a guest. Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, uh, beautiful. Uh, thank you so much. Other folks? I definitely, at age 11, um, so I, I grew up in Dubai, but my we went to Egypt where I'm from for summers. And at, I, I was the eldest of like seven cousins. Um, so at age 11, I made a pact with my cousins that we were going to wake up at 5 a.m. while all of our parents, we were at my grandma's house, while our parents are asleep. I had written this four page script about vampires and we were going to act it out and record it on our like Nokia phones. Um, I photo. I went to a photocopy place and photocopied this four-page script that I had written by hand, and then we woke up the neighbors and were grounded <laughs> and could not ever um, make the film. I still think about that film. <laughs> sure, I don't have a long anecdote. I think I just um, I just remember 
really trying to color in the lines of uh, an outline, you know, the images that they give you as a kid and just being really stressed out, trying to make sure I don't color outside the line. Um, I think when I was, I think five or six, uh, my mom taught me English growing up and she would teach me English by reading me novels and comic books. Uh, and so I decided it was my time to write my own comic book. And I remember I was like five or six. I told my mom, nobody bothered me. I have to go write, make art. And I would sit at the dining table and I spent six hours writing a comic book. And so I just would write superheroes, superheroes, superheroes. And I didn't, my English was so clumsy. So I wrote all the names wrong and they were like me, but then not me. And then my brother was like the villain, like, you know what I mean? Like it was all this. Sort of, and so, and I just spent like five years making comic book heroes. I, I should have asked this question of you the first time I met you in class. I feel like I just learned everything that we ever worked with and dealt with and our obsessed conversations about love in theater and you know coloring inside the light it's like some crazy metaphor of, of how we navigate thank you for sharing that um it was just going to be a little icebreaker I, I feel all deep about it now um uh, I, I want to talk a little more I gave some context about NYU Abu Dhabi and this I actually legitimately have never had a conversation with any of you about this which is I, I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about just your process of selecting NYU Abu Dhabi. I mean, there is a legitimate um, space of uh, sort of that the imagination has to fill about what it would be like to go to school there. There's different experiences, different geographical locations. I and mean, you had a different experience in terms of where you were growing up. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering what that was and if there were people in the conversation with you or was it a, a plunge of faith? Um, and just what that journey was, yeah. You want to jump in? Yeah, I'll go first since I'm the oldest one, uh, since I was there for the first one. Um, yeah, so when, uh, you know, uh, as maybe different than your experience, right? When when uh, NYU Abu Dhabi came up, there really was the dream of it. There was the promise of something, right? That there was going to happen, that was going to happen, that was going to happen. And I think, I love that you brought up this idea of borderlanders, weirdos. I actually like to think of outsiders as well, because I think, you know, I come from Chile, so Latin American. Uh, you are either four things when you when you uh, graduate high school. You're a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, or a businessman. That's the four things you do. Uh, and I was like, well, what if I don't want to do those things? And they're like, you're an engineer, you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're a businessman. And and so the dream of Abu Dhabi was really, and you go to school to one of those professions immediately after. Like it's like you go to med school. You, you don't get to explore. You graduate high school, you sort of figure it out at 18, and good luck. Uh, and I wasn't sure, didn't know where I fit. I think I liked a lot of different things. And the, the dream of Abu Dhabi was not only the, it was far away enough that my parents wouldn't be able to figure out what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was also the promise of an adventure, of something new, of something, I, I think, you know, I remember my mom kind of supported me. She says now she does. Um, but, uh, you know, we did all the exams. She's like, well, you're doing really well. Maybe do you want to go to the US instead? And I said, but mom, I feel like what a crazy story to say I went to study in a new university in the Middle East. Like, that just felt like such a story to tell. I feel like it was an adventure. Even it all, like, my mom is like, do you think there's going to be one? Like, in next year, it's like, I don't know, but what a crazy story to tell. Uh, and so it was a mixture of that. It was a mixture of the adventure. It was a mixture of not fitting in with the system and figuring out, well, I could go really far away and explore this idea that I didn't quite understand, which was liberal arts. It's not a thing in Chile. I don't understand quite how it works. And I'm fascinated by it now after done it and being like teaching in it. But I think it was that, that sort of mixture of like this amorphous thing that we get to create together. And I could create my future and create a community or university together. But it's interesting idea that you mentioned that because to me, this is another strain that runs through Abu Dhabi students, which is that there's this instinct towards leadership. And I don't mean leadership as power and as like follow me, but as building, as making, not just I'm gonna do my job, I'm gonna go away, but part of what you're describing is this uh, attraction to being part of building something, right? Which is such a kind of instinctual space because you never built a university before, right? Um, it's also worth noting, correct me if I'm wrong, when all of you arrived, we were still in Sama Tower? You were, the two of you were the first, right? So in the case of Atil and Fatima, we had a temporary campus uh, in the downtown of Abu Dhabi. So there wasn't actually even a campus per se, it was an office building that had been converted into classrooms and an apartment building that had been converted into dorms in the middle of town. And so you couldn't even be like, but look at the campus, right? The other challenge is when the two of you arrived to a campus, it was a colony in Mars, which is there was nothing there. And so there's an equal kind of uh, what are we building question, uh, which is interesting. Thank you, Ati. A any other thoughts on that choice too? Yeah, I mean, my, my experience was um, less 
uh, I, I grew up in Dubai. And so I had heard about this NYU campus opening up in Abu Dhabi since I was like in my in middle school. And I was very dead set on not going there because I I really wanted to be as far from my family as possible. That was that that was the common thread. Um, and then, yeah, it's fun. my mom is actually watching. She woke up at 1 a.m. in Egypt to watch this. Um, but um, and we joke about this to this day. And then towards the last couple of years of high school, I actually moved back to Egypt, where my family is from. And uh, and so I went to international schools growing up. I had uh, classmates from all around the world. And then being in Egypt and my the dream, like at that younger age, was to go to the U.S. because I was like an A student and I was like going to get a scholarship and go to the U.S. And then in Egypt, I was kind of the odd kid out because I was the kid who just moved back to Egypt after growing up elsewhere. And um, then I applied to all the schools. I applied to NYU Abu Dhabi and a bunch of other schools. But I had this distinct thing, realization over my two years in Egypt that in the US, I was there was also going to be like a default culture that I was going to be coming into. And something, and then I got, a, we had, I don't know if Candidate Weekend still exists, but um, we had Candidate Weekend, which was uh, people who are like in the final rounds of applications or went to Abu Dhabi for a weekend and just meeting people from Utah, people from uh, countries I'd never heard of and like actually learning so much about what the institution was and, and being in spaces where I, I think I came into the weekend thinking I had an exact idea of what I was going to do. I wanted at the time I wanted to study um, film and having remember that I still have a film major. It's very funny. Uh, but um, um, yeah, having an exact idea of what I wanted to do and then leaving the weekend and feeling like I have to go back to the drawing boards and I have I know nothing and there's so much to know. And that was a really exciting feeling. Um, and I didn't think I got in, but then I got in and I was like, I think I'm going to go here. Um, and the proximity to like where I grew up was actually to me very much uh, initially a drawback, but it, it, it really like connecting this space, which was so distinct from the rest of the UAE to like my roots and upbringing there was so um, was something that ultimately became incredibly meaningful for me. Well, I hate to flatter, but you and your company were a massive part of how I decided to go to the school. I feel uh, my journey was very bizarrely specific for NYU Abu Dhabi because many, I think many people were like, I don't know, it's this crazy campus. But I had the wonderful privilege of having a mentor since I was 11, this man named Michael Liddig, who if you ever meet him, he's one of the best human beings to ever live. Uh, and he is why I wanted to become an actor in the first place and why I pursued theater in the first place. And his form of acting always had a global lens. So from the time I was 11, Broadway in New York City was not my entire world. From the time I was 11, I was watching documentaries about Mongolia and that was theater. And that, so my, my language around these things, I, I had a, a very big worldview and I was born and raised in Utah. So I had nothing. <laughs> but a very specific Mormon isolated uh, point of view around me. And Michael works, of course, with Theater Me Too, Ruben's incredible company. And uh, when I was a little dweeby 17 year old, he said, you should Google this program. They, they have this incredible theater program. Uh, it's everything you're looking for. And there were so many, as soon as I Googled it, so many things that just aligned. The, the John Sexton play the piano boys, thing that every student heard for so many years at that campus. But the, the sort of every encounter every day should open you. That, that's what brought me. And uh, I'm very, very happy I went with that choice. It was the best theater education I think anyone could get. Uh, thanks for, the, for, for linking the company, because you, you, you um, were so receptive to that conversation with uh, my dear collaborator, Michael. But you mentioned two things that I think are really important and I find quite moving. One is this um, culture that I think is part of the campus from its beginning, 
which was that every experience should somehow open your world up more, that every experience shouldn't quell your curiosity, curiosity but rather drive it more, right? Um, which is in its most formal frame research and it, in its most amplified just exploration, exploration of what you're doing and um, growth as, as part and parcel of, of the work there versus this kind of um, roaded mentality, Ati, that you were saying was expected in a Chilean context, um, which is interesting. And again, this this sort of borderland plays out itself there differently, right? Which is having this point of view. Um, I, I, I'm so revisiting these early conversations when I think we talked when you were in that process and it was uh, so joyful to see that hunger already. Um, yeah. I think as an 18 year old who had just lived in the same city, gone to the same school, had the same friends, lived in the same house up until that point, um, I think it was honestly purely a practical decision on some level to have access to that kind of education on a scholarship. But I think the underlying desire to just absolutely just, you know, create a path for myself or to just do the things that I'd never gotten a chance to do before in life, which was to travel or to study a wide variety of things and to have security and comfort doing so. Um, I think of course those played a big part and I think I, I, I'm very grateful for all of those things. And um, you know, they came to me with time um, and um, I learned a lot in the process. I, I, this this next question, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of double up, and you can choose either to mix it or separate it or as you wish. Which is so, so there you are making this decision, the expectations, the goals, and so forth, and you arrive. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the journey to in the middle of this space to decide whenever it happened, I'm going to be a theater major, right? Which across, I just if you don't know this across the globe that is possibly continues to be one of the most irrational decisions <laughs> that a young person can make. Not because there's anything wrong, but because the world looks at you with every possible view of like, are you sure? Like I, I both in my previous capacity as of chair of drama and my current capacity as associate dean, I'll go to parents weekend and they're like, yeah, but my student wants to study theater. And I'm like, you, you know, I'm a theater mate. Like, that's what I do. That's my entire life, right? And, and it's just interesting, the, the sort of baggage that comes, the often very loving but limited view of what it is, like all these things. So I recognize that it's already a challenge. But there you are in the Middle East, in a new university, and whether it's the phone call back home or the conversation with friends, that you're like, I'm a theater major. Could you talk about how you got there? That's point one, and you can mix these. The second question is, whether before that or once you were on your journey, if you could talk about a, a formative experience at NYU Abu Dhabi, something that helped shape you or shape that journey as, as they link. Um, you grab the mic, Fatima. Yeah, I can go. I think uh, definitely in going to NYU Abu Dhabi, just, you know, getting, I was very excited to get the chance to travel and all, do all of these crazy things, but I also wanted to major in economics and, you know, make my parents proud um, and and that that was that went for a second and then until my sophomore year spring semester my formative experience was taking making theater with Ruben and um, realizing that there's so much more to life than just doing things that you're supposed to and um, I think it was the first time uh, in a very long time because again you know having lived a very prescribed life both of my parents are doctors migrated from their village to be in Lahore I'm the oldest daughter of brown parents so there were a lot of set expectations on what I can and cannot and should and should not do and so I think just being in that class uh, I think it was the first time in a very long time that I felt that I had things to say and there were people to listen to. And, um, you know, that there were all these things that I could create with my own two hands that felt amazing to make and a community to establish. And, you know, um, it was something that I did for myself. And I think that class taught me a lot about um, just really thinking about what matters to me and how much I want that um, in order to pursue that. And, um, Still finished my econ major, uh, even a concentration in finance. But um, I think by the fourth year, I was like, yeah, this is, this is what I care about the most. And this is what I end up going to do eventually. I'm, I'm so moved by you citing that making theater class. And thank you for even naming that in your narrative. But I'm actually most moved by you intoning the word community as linked to that class. Because I think often what's forgotten is that 
yes, for me, one of the goals is the teaching space, but it's about how do we generate community because that is the thing that drives the theater, right? And so to hear your name that not only was it about things to say, but that there was someone to hear, that there was actually a community there. And I hope that you have a memory of the community in those classes, right? Of, of sitting on the floor and doing that work and whatever the experience was. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, thank you. Are there thoughts on the formative or the theater major? I have so much I could say, but I would keep you all night. Um, I'm very extra and I'm gonna show you something that I prepared because I thought this question might happen. <laughs> this is, no one can see it on the camera, but this is a list of every theater class I got to take over the four years, which is 27 classes total, because it's a little bit of a cop out. I knew I wanted to do theater from the second I applied to the school, but the fact that I could just like delve in, and I'll grant three of these classes are core classes, but it was Reinvention of Love, Global Shakespeare, and Ritual and Play with Richard Schechner. So still kind of theater class. Um, all of those classes, it's almost, it's honestly bizarre. Out of 27 classes, nine are theater studies, more scholarly theory, eight are as a performer, uh, nine are practicums, so playwriting, making stuff, making stuff with you, uh, pro producing, devising, all of these things. And then Reinvention of Love, I just said all. Because <laughs> I don't know how to describe that class. Um, but just that I could have the ability to try to do all those things the entire four years and every second of every single one of those classes was rigorous. Every second, if I wrote a paper, <laughs> you gave me my first B ever. <laughs> <laughs> Ted Zider here in the audience. <laughs> if I wrote a paper, I could expect that they were going to hand me or hold me to a standard that I had never known was even possible for me to achieve, let alone view for myself. Um, so that was the constant experience. A slight cop out because you made me think of it when you're talking about community. <laughs> in our first class, first year, you pulled me aside at the end of class and you said, I've noticed that when we're in class, you only write down what you think and what I say. You never write down what your classmates say. <laughs> and I felt very red. I felt uh, very judged. But it was true because I had, once again, I had come from a very religious community. I was a young 18-year-old who had had to kind of shut out what the world had told me for a very long time because they told me, to get married, to stay home, that I should never leave, that I was hurting my family by leaving. And so to have a moment where it says, that's not true anymore. <laughs> you now have a true community. All these people were in that class with me. Um, listen to them, learn from them, build on what they're doing. Um, and that, that stayed with me ever since. I'm, it, it changed how I, you know, any, any room that I try to be a student in now, that is my standard is it's not about the great thought I have. It's about what everyone else is saying and how can I build on that so that we build the knowledge that we're learning together. So. Somebody talks, I'm going to choke up. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I remember our Marhaba week and you singing cabaret in our variety show. And that was, um, I remember being like, I think I, I think of, I, I think I'm going to be friends with this person. <laughs> and then we started talking and I like, you know, you asked that question as like an early freshman, like what classes are you taking in your first semester? And you were taking fundamentals of acting with Catherine Corey. <laughs> and I was like, I just feel like I could like, I could never be a good actor. I could never like, I'm really scared of the idea of being in front of people in that way. And you were like, you should just take it. Like nothing, like what's the worst that can happen? And so then I ended up in that class and um, I was not a great actor in any way. And like, I did not, I was always like very um, anxious and all types of things, but it was really, I was your scene partner. I think I also like was s somewhat stalking you at the time. Do you remember that? Uh, so, um, and so that was like maybe also, I, that was maybe also part of why I signed up for that class. But um, I think <laughs> moving on from that, Fun fact, um, 
I had like my parents had read Shakespeare to me going to bed uh, in Arabic growing uh, as like a, in like elementary school basically and but that was really the extent of my exposure to like plays in dramatic form like dialogue and stage directions um and in that class I we read plays I mean, we read plays by Yusuf Gindi. We read plays by, we read Tony Kushner. We read plays, we read Masquerade for the Wounded, which I think you had translated at that. We read so many uh, plays from all around the world in translation. And like, I will say that my first exposure to theater being in NYU Abu Dhabi really spoiled me because I, then I moved on to the world thinking that it was going to continue to be in that way and it wasn't quite. But um, I remember at the end of that class, Catherine being like, I, yeah, like you're not necessarily going to continue acting beyond this class, but have you considered that you might be a playwright? And I was like, no, that's, that's no, what's that? And then, um, and there had not been a playwriting class at NYU Abu Dhabi at that point. Um, and Catherine was, you know, doing her Catherine thing <laughs> and I mean, ensuring that there was to be one in the semesters to come. And that was, um, I believe in that first year, Abhishek Majamdar, who's currently a faculty member in the program, um, had come as a guest artist and uh, we read his work. And in the next, I believe in my third semester, we then ended up be in the, the fundamentals of playwriting class, which was really transformative for me, obviously. Um, yeah, I wanna, I wanna shout out another moment. Um, and I think like the, specifically this idea that it is both, cause I, now having been uh, seeing other configurations of how theater education looks, there are a lot of like BA theater studies programs and like a BFA where like, you're just going to be an actor or to be a director. And I think the fact that like, we could be in a room where, uh, where Kofi Kuali would like come and, uh, and we would he hear a theater of the real play in translation with the translator in the room and Richard Schechner in the room and Carol Martin in the room. And then the next semester, we would like talk about it in a theoretical setting. And then we would be in an Abhishek class where we would like write our own theater of the real piece. That, that was, um, that bridge between praxis and theory was, um, again, not something I realized was so special until years later. <laughs> I, I, again, I appreciate the, the many things that are coming up. And one of the things that you said earlier is the taking of the class where you're like, what's there to risk, right? Like, just take it. Um, and what it means to actually live and be part of and hold a community where risk is part of the work, right? And I, I think it is something that we develop a little bit of an addiction to. You're like, Let, let's keep that community. And certainly a challenge when you leave those spaces, how you continue to hold community that pushes you, that has these expectations versus that says, oh, that's okay, that's great. And everything sort of goes down a little bit. And so I, uh, I appreciate that. And also the, the uniqueness of being part of a community of scholars, of artists who are teachers so that they are in the field while teaching on the field is such a vital part of the culture of NYU, certainly of Tish, certainly of other spaces, but certainly of NYU Abu Dhabi, which is really, really, um, I think, powerful to have that. And the building of the program, I mean, I remember that conversation, which was, we need a playwriting class, <laughs> like Adam needs to play. And so that build is really exciting. And I think something that is a, a great reminder to all of us, right, that the, the curriculum is not, any curriculum is not a theological thing that's been granted by the mountain. It's for students, it's for the build. And, and I think that's such an important thing to remember in institutions. Uh, Atilio, I, I wanna go to you on this question because you have a different journey, which is of course you went there, you got in, you went, you went through your journey, but you continue to stay there as a global arts fellow, which lead, led to a TA, you TA for me, you TA for other folks. And so your journey is a little broader in that spectrum. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about just that in terms of formative and theater major in the bigger picture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I'll try. Oh, there's a lot, so much to talk about. Um, no, uh, I, I think, uh, and one of the things like you and I bonded so much uh, uh, is that I also was not a theater major in the beginning. I was a history major. Uh, I was going to be an archaeologist. Uh, and then crazy, it's just the remarkable teacher they brought to teach one of the first history classes there, David Lering Lewis, thought it was a graduate class and not an undergrad. So we were reading like insane amounts of books every week and everybody's like burning out. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I can do this. Um, and so for many other reasons as well, I went into this big, really big crisis. And I remember sitting with an academic uh, counselor and, he, and they just said, just open, just open the bulletin and choose all the classes you want, but just take them. 
and they were all the artistic classes. But what was remarkable was they weren't just the theater classes, the theater, the film, the creative writing. It was all this intersection, which has always been such in the spirit of that university, right? Which is we get to make kind of our own curriculum. It's a dream of the liberal arts. And it was like really uh, happening there. And a little bit supporting what you were saying. And I think continuing this intersectional sort of spirit, right? Um, I remember two moments. I'm going to put you on the spot again, but I'm also going to put that person over there on the spot as well. Dear mentors of mine, right? Um, which is... Um, I remember, uh, uh, you know, I'm a theater major, so you want to be an actor. That's like what we do. We're theater majors. We're actors. We're just actors. Like, you want to act. You want to be famous. And I remember telling this to Catherine. It's like, well, Catherine, how do I become a better actor? It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. What else do you want to do? It's like, what do you mean? It's like, I want to be an actor. It's like, but what else? Do you want to write? Do you want to teach? Do you want to travel? Do you want to research? Do you want to create community? Like, what else? What is it beyond acting that you want to do? Which is such a, also like a big, ambitious question, which leads me to, I remember, you know, so I started doing being a theater major, right? Uh, and I was felt behind because it was the, the, the American students were really ahead in some ways. And I wasn't sure if I fit. And I was trying to take theater classes and I was scared. And I remember doing this like reality show musical and it did not go very well for me. And I remember like locking myself in the dressing room crying because I was like, maybe I fail. Maybe I don't think I can do this. And you came. You showed up and you were like, breathe. <laughs> and then I need you to remember this feeling you know, because I need you to remember this moment and understand that as an artist, this you i need you not to be frustrated i need you to be dissatisfied and let this moment fuel you for the rest of your time here and i just remember that because i think there was something in way would have as well that spirit of dissatisfaction i don't mean frustration just we were dissatisfied with what was going on in the world with the moment with the education system with what we could be with what it means to art with our own communities and we were just striving it was always like well what else what more could we do i think that was a selfish reason why i stayed i think there was a sense that i felt something that was very much taught also in the community was that we had to give back. And I always felt like I owed too much to this group, this community, the university, they gave so much to me that I wanted to give back. And I always felt that for me staying for two years, I always felt like I bloomed late. So I was like, oh, now I know what I want to do. So now I need to leave. No, I'm just going to stay. But I think also is I've always felt, you know, we are the weirdos, right? And so when people look, I never had somebody who had my path, right? And so I didn't know what to do. But I felt if I stayed and I could be a teacher for somebody else, then I could be somebody's path. And then be like, oh, well, he did it, so maybe I can do it. And I always felt there's something beautiful about that, about like being the first person to take that path, because we have a responsibility for the people who come after us. I, I thank you, Ati, for sharing that in, in that bigger context. I, I appreciate that. And I do think, um, you know, they're, 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 that, that uh, it's a big mantra of mine for sure, this, this idea of being dissatisfied. I think as artists, you inherit this idea that your artistic work comes out of inspiration. And so for me as an artist, I always felt terrible because I thought I should sit under a tree and be like, I have an idea. But I realized my work comes out of dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction about the world, dissatisfaction about the state of things, dissatisfaction about my last project. I'm like, I can do it better. I can do it again. I can, right? And so the drive is that. And then I get inspiration. Then I get ideas. And so for me, it was meaningful to, to share that because in the building of anything, any kind of uh, thing that doesn't go right quickly leads to frustration. And I feel like that's just gonna knock you out of the game, right? It, versus dissatisfied, it's you know the good old fashioned get back up on the horse, but it's more than that. It's acknowledging that like, you're not happy with it. You're not happy with how it went versus like, it's okay. You're not happy, so you try again, right? And that's the, the other big mantra that you all sort of got in your ear over and over from me, uh, which is to stay in the attempt. Right, which which was the, the the great goal, and to me, NYU Abu Dhabi was such a manifestation of that, of staying in the attempt in your classes, in your majors, in the build of the community, in being econ and theater, um, in being all of the things that you were trying and succeeded in, in doing and being there. Um, thank you, Ati, for sharing that. I feel like you were going to say something, Ati. Did I interrupt? You said try again, so okay. we're good. <laughs>